Good afternoon and welcome to CFA UK's Wednesday webinar at 1. My name is Gerhard Sobel. We're absolutely delighted to have Helen Thomas with us once again, presenting on whether any deal can get a parliamentary majority. Timing couldn't be better. Helen is the founder of Blonde Money, a macroeconomic and political consultancy firm based in Oxford and London. Helen has almost two decades of experience working in financial markets for banks and fund managers. Most recently, she was head of Currency Alpha at State Street. She was also an advisor to former Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, and Director of Financial Markets Reform Program at Policy. The presentation will take about 30 minutes, followed by Q&A. Please participate in the Q&A session using the appropriate box on your screens, as it is not every day we have Helen here with us. Helen, over to you. Thank you very much, Gerhard. And hello and welcome to everyone on what a historic day in UK politics. There's been a little, um, a lot of talk that we would come to, you know, the, the day of reckoning. Um, I actually do not believe that today is that day, but we are getting ever closer to it. Uh, we have a fundamentally divided electorate and a fundamentally divided House of Commons. And that, of course, is what is leading us to the difficult place where we now find ourselves. I am going to talk about the specifics of the leadership contest. Of course, that uh, it's a fast moving, uh, it's a fast moving agenda. And of course, when I put these slides together, we, we didn't have all that information. However, there is a point in which this no confidence vote is just one stage in a process. It is the beginning of a chain reaction of events that we think are going to take place over the next four to six weeks, whatever happens this evening. So let me start by showing you a map of Parliament and its opinions on Brexit. This is a piece of work that my team put together by going through every single MP uh, over the summer period, we created a ranking from minus 15 on the left, which is remain, to plus 15 on the right, which is leave. And every MP, we measured them on 23 different criteria, which allowed us to give them a ranking to place them on this scale. And the first thing you can see is, although we hear a lot from the extremes. We hear a lot from people who desperately want to remain in the EU and people who desperately want to leave immediately handing over no money. We hear from them, but they are in the minority. As you might expect, they are at the wings of the distribution. But what this picture also clearly shows you, we have uh, divided up the number of MPs by colour to show their party. If we take the blue bars, this is the problem Theresa May has, the MPs are distributed across a quite a broad spectrum of opinions. So there's quite a few around the minus four level, but there's quite a lot around the plus 10 level. Somebody who is plus 10 would be somebody like Boris Johnson, a very clear Brexiteer. Minus four would probably be somebody who could support staying in a customs union or in Norway. But having said it's a problem for the Conservative Party and what Theresa May has been grappling with, it is also a problem for the Labour Party. They are slightly more clustered. Oh, somebody says they can't hear me. Can you still hear me? I'm just stopping for a second. Gerhardt, can you hear me? Yes, yes, uh, oh, I can hear I you. Note, I got a note from someone listening saying the sound had disappeared. So just stopping in case we can. Anyway, good. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, so the Labour Party have a similar problem. They're similarly split. They're just slightly more clustered around the Remain. Helen, Helen, can you hold on a second? Sure. Uh, can everyone hear Helen? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wouldn't like to carry on for 20 minutes and have lost you all. <sighs> so, so the first thing we see from this is, is the, the ideological split within the parties and that it is a problem for not just the Conservative Party, but also Labour. Now, that meant 
that it was always going to be very difficult to get any deal through Parliament. And, uh, of course, complicated by the fact that Theresa May never had a majority government in the first place. If we just go on to the next step, though, the question really is how ideological is Parliament? And we also looked into this. We found that people who had very strong red lines on remaining or on leaving, and we added them up. And basically, as you can see, although we hear a lot from people on the fringes, there are a lot of people near the fringe who also have an extreme, uh, extreme opinion about things. So um, on our calculations at this point, 173 Remainers, 165 Brexiteers, Parliament is 650 MPs. So broadly speaking, 25 to 30% of Parliament is ideologically one way or the other on Brexit. And of course, the problem is they add up together to more than half of Parliament. Uh, overall, we have them at 342. That is why it is we, we were always going to end up in a stalemate, unless Theresa May could come up with a deal that helped them both out. And of course, <laughs> the complication of this deal is she doesn't really have a deal. This is purely a withdrawal agreement to allow us to continue to talk and come up with a deal in the next 18 months. But it is this dreaded backstop, which, uh, of course, is causing all the kerfuffle because that that is an insurance uh, ins insurance project that kicks in if certain things don't happen in 18 months time. So although we're supposed to start talking about 18 months from now, the the future is already in the present because of the structure of the backstop. By the way, I'm aware somebody still can't hear, but I'm going to carry on unless I hear otherwise. So there we there we have the um, sheer intractability of the problem, uh, which obviously has become more than evident by the fact that Theresa May didn't even want to put it to a vote because she knew how much she would lose by. She needed, as we can see from our chart, she needed Labour rebels. And the Labour Party, for all of their division, uh, seemed to be unable to, uh, to, to lend any support to the Conservative Party. That's not completely surprising, but it is when we think about the problems within the Labour Party, which, which we're going to come up to. Now, when it came down to the actual parliamentary vote, our team here, this is uh, pictures of our team at work, we like to get our hands dirty, we like to get we like to get wargaming in a House of Cards style. We actually have a, a board up where we have four, maybe, and against, and we were moving MPs around the board to see how it might go. And we came up with this uh, point. Oh, sorry. I don't know where that chart has gone. But anyway, we came up with the point being that there were approximately 97 Conservative MPs who were almost definitely going to vote against Theresa May's deal. Now, that was just far too much of a problem, uh, you know, whatever happened. And of course, it's something to bear in mind ahead of today's vote. If 97 of her own MPs were willing to defy the whip in Parliament, in public, on a vote of record that they didn't support her deal, how do those people feel today when they're going to vote on her being their leader in a secret ballot? I should mention this point about a secret ballot tonight. Uh, so the um, you may have already heard, just in the last half an hour, the BBC's political editor has reported that 158 Conservative MPs have declared their support for Theresa May in public. And of course, you'd like to hope or think that MPs would be honest and true to their word, and that 158 have said they'll support us, so 158 will. Now, 158 is important because that is half the parliamentary party. If Theresa May wins this vote tonight, then, and she only needs half the party, 158 to do so, she cannot be challenged again for the leadership uh, until 12 months' time. Now, that is what has stayed the hand of her executioners until today. Because um, even though the Brexiteers are desperate to get somebody who's more of a Brexiteer on their side and running, a, the, their, running their party and the government, they always ran the risk. If they did it too soon, people would just default to Theresa May because there was uh, an unpalatable alternative. Um, and 
the fact they've actually decided to go for this suggests that, frankly, the momentum is turning against Theresa May, not only from Brexiteers, but also from Remainers. Um, we've, we've seen, actually, you know, you see people talk a lot about Boris Johnson, but his brother Joe Johnson also recently resigned from Cabinet because he believes there should be a people's vote. In fact, he believes Theresa May was too far to the Brexit side of things for his view and that the, the, the deal was just a worse situation than we were in at the moment and we'd be better to think again on our relationship with Europe. So she's she's already been shedding people on the Brexiteer side, but she's clearly been shedding them on the Remainer side as well. But when it comes to the mechanics for tonight, this is where this is where the MPs have to think long and hard about how they feel because of the point that she, if she wins, she stays for another 12 months. Do they think, are they somebody on the Remainer or centrist, pragmatic side of the Conservative Party who feel that if a candidate like Boris Johnson or Dominic Raab, someone clearly a lever, were to end up in the final two of a Tory leadership contest? Because that's what happens. The MPs vote between themselves until only two candidates are left, then those two candidates go to the Tory membership and the Conservative Party members will select who becomes the leader of the party and, of course, Prime Minister. So do the people who are Remainers feel that they'd rather stick with Theresa May than risk Boris Johnson? Or do they feel so strongly about her management of the party? Do they fear an election? Do they just feel that she has been such a shambles, it's going to make Brexit a mess, whatever their opinion is, that they just think it's worth gambling and getting rid of her. And that is, I mean, we're actually just working on some analysis literally this morning on, on, on how to uh, play this, but it's, it's going to be difficult for her to be sure of getting those 158 MPs. Because um, both sides have a, ha, ha, both Remainers and Brexiteers um, have a risk. And also, don't forget, these opportunities do not come along very often in an MP's life. And MPs are always keen to have a crack at power. You will see at least, I would think, 20 candidates go to try and become leader if she loses, which is a, a big field of candidates. Um, and even if they don't win, of course, that has to get down to two people. Um, they will hope to be in the cabinet of whoever wins. So. Um, there's a, there's a little moment here, uh, uh, there's a, a three to four week window where you could either be prime minister or in a cabinet or at least have your hands on the levers of power. And that is what will really focus their minds. If they vote for Theresa May, that doesn't really happen anymore. Because as we've seen anyway, she's running the process in rather a shambolic fashion, let's be honest. But talking of power, we need to talk about the Labour Party. So yes, it appears none of them were particularly won over to voting for uh, the, the, the Theresa May's deal. But the thing is that they have their own issues in terms of their approach towards Jeremy Corbyn. So Jeremy Corbyn also leads a divided party, many of whom are not very happy with him. So we wanted to analyse and look at which Labour MPs actually, if push comes to shove, could splinter away from the Corbyn opinion. And we then created a new matrix and a new set of criteria for pro and anti-Corbyn opinions. So we had 11 different criteria for this. Examples of things like, did they vote against Corbyn or resign from the shadow cabinet? Did Are they a member of Momentum, which is the Corbyn supporting group, or are they an enemy of Momentum? And we were able to come up with the following chart identifying Labour MPs who will defy the whip. Now, the left to right scale is the same as the one we saw before. On the left is the extreme remain, on the right, extreme leave. But we've introduced a new axis, which at the top is pro-Corbyn, and at the bottom is anti-Corbyn, running from uh, minus 10 to plus 10. Now, as you might expect, for those of you who follow these things and actually forgive me, I am such a political geek that I sadly know the names of all of these people, but 
for, for many of you, you you have blissfully been unaware of, of many of these MPs who, who pop up from time to time. And I know we'll have international listeners as well to this webinar. But uh, just to put some names out there, Diane Abbott is often talked about as a very pro-Corbyn MP who's keen to remain in the EU, and she's up there sort of on the top row in the middle. But we sort of highlighted this pink area. Those are people who are against Jeremy Corbyn, but they're pragmatists. They're kind of in the middle of our distribution. They don't feel necessarily that strongly about remaining or leaving. Those are people who also have their constituents to bear in mind. Because here's the real problem for Parliament. We know 52% of the country voted to leave. But when you look at it on a constituency basis, it's about 420 constituencies that voted to leave and only about 120 MPs who voted to leave. And that is the real difficult part of Parliament, uh, is that um, a number of these MPs have to deliver leaving. And some of these MPs that we've picked up at the bottom here, uh, there's Kevin Jones and Ruth Smeath. They actually, about six to eight weeks ago, said, um, we understand Jeremy Corbyn wants us to vote down any government deal, but in the example of one of these, 67% of my constituency voted to leave. How can I deny them this? Uh, and that is, you know, that's the crux potential problem for some of these Labour MPs. Now, as it stands, the strategy for Labour has very sensibly been stand back and let the Conservative Party beat themselves up and tear themselves apart. Leave them bleeding on the canvas so when we go in for the kill, we can go for a no confidence vote in the government and we can seize power. And as you're seeing, that's still how it plays out. To the point, I might add, that people were expecting a no confidence vote to go in from Jeremy Corbyn towards the government. Uh, he didn't do it because he said we were only going to do it after the vote and we haven't had the vote yet. But Nicola Sturgeon, leader of the Scottish National Party, and Vince Cable, leader of the Liberal Democrats, have both publicly in the last 24 hours denounced the Labour Party for this strategy, basically saying we are ready to go. We are ready to vote down this government. Why aren't you? What are you doing? Now, again, either this is clever play by Jeremy Corbyn and he just uh, is playing for time to, to see the Tories damaged, or perhaps the Labour Party themselves are divided over what their Brexit policy should be. And they don't really want to have to start making that clear to everybody while um, the Conservatives are the ones with the spotlight shining on them. Now, our database, and please do let us know, get in touch if you'd like to look at it. Our database does mean, however, that we have this MP by MP analysis, which means that we can really drill down into who the key names are. Because, you know, we keep hearing from Jacob Rees-Mogg, extreme Brexiteer, Chukka Amana or Anna Subri, extreme Remainers. But they are only part of the, a small part of the whole process of the 650 MPs. So... We had a client ask us, can you just give us a list of anti-Corbyn pragmatists who are in leave seats? And, you know, the, we are able to pick up about 50 MPs here that we would keep our eye on for being in our Brexit rating fairly pragmatic and in the middle. But their leave, their vote for leave in their constituency is something between 60 to 70 percent. Uh, and we've also put in their majority because that could also have an impact. A lot of these seats are safe Labour seats in the north of England, but some people do have a small majority to also worry about. That will also focus minds. Ian Austin, top right, second down. Dudley North, 71.4% vote to leave. He only has a majority of 0.1%. And there is an election coming. May, may not be until the scheduled 2022, but it is coming. Will his voters feel that he did the right thing by then. So this is this is the uh, the granularity you really do have to go into to try and make a sensible analysis of the probability of outcomes from this point forward. That's my parliamentary vote numbers. There we go. Exactly. So this is how it, why she had to pull the vote at, at the last minute. The sheer scale of people against her, she just didn't have enough. I mean, bottom left 
the the loss that the Conservative Party could have faced purely just from their own MPs rebelling against it, you know, and our central scenario was 98, but it could have been 173. Again, remember those numbers when we say 158 MPs are needed to back Theresa May tonight. If they were willing to publicly go against her in a vote on her deal, how are they going to go for the secret ballot tonight when it comes to choosing the direction of their party and who they want to lead them into the next election? Next steps. I'm aware we've only got about 10 minutes left. I've got about three more slides. Next steps. This is what uh, has been discussed for some time after her losing the vote. Well, the vote hasn't taken place. It may well not take place until the middle of January. Um, but potential next steps, renegotiate the deal. That's obviously what she's trying to do, although she's finding that the EU are saying they will not do that. We also calculate that only 45 of the MPs who are against her deal have actually cited the backstop as a problem. So even if they did renegotiate, they don't necessarily get anywhere. Conservative leadership challenge, well, that's happening now. But the real problem is there's no clear candidate. Uh, there is no candidate uniting either side. The ERG is the European Research Group of Brexiteers. Then there are people in the cabinet, then there are Remainers. As I say, it will be a crowded field when we finally, uh, when we finally get to it. And then there's a no confidence vote in the government. 31 of these have been brought since World War II. Only one was successful in getting rid of the government. That was in 1979, just as Thatcher came in. But there is talk that they might do a, a vote of censure instead. This is a little bit technical. Uh, some people would say that a censure motion is a vote of no confidence, but technically it means you want to bring it against a particular MP and you want to tell them they've been bad and they've done terrible things and they should be basically censured for being a poor minister, uh, me member of parliament. Now, there's talk that Labour might bring that first before they do an actual no confidence vote. Partly that is so that the DUP, that's the Northern Irish Party, who currently have a confidence and supply agreement with the Conservatives in order to get them a majority in Parliament, because you need 323 and the Conservatives on last year's election only have 315 MPs. So they need the 10 DUP MPs to actually be a functioning government. The DUP do not like Theresa May's deal. They have said that they would vote it down. They've said if it got voted through, they would consider supporting a no confidence motion. They would also consider trying to get Theresa May changed and get someone else in charge. So um, a censure motion would allow them to vote with Labour and tell the government they're not bluffing without actually necessarily forcing um, a change in the government. But really, all of these things that we talk about as next steps, it really depends on where you want to get to. They are the choice of weapon. They are not the end goal. So people talk, will there be an election? I get asked this all the time. Will there be an election? Will there be a second referendum? Well, it depends. Are we going more towards no deal or more towards no Brexit? We saw at the beginning of this, there are extreme ideologues, approximately 25 to 30% of parliament on each side, basically coalescing around either no deal or no Brexit. They will use things like a no-confidence vote, an election, a threat of a referendum to try and get there. But of course, at the moment, everything is up for grabs. There's no leadership. There's no government. I mean, there's no functioning government now anyway. I mean, part of the reason Sterling suddenly fell this week, I think, was the realisation that that's true. And it has been true for a number of weeks. But the, but the factions at the moment are very split. There is now the extreme remainers. They, they are now able to revoke Article 50. Uh, is, is open to them as an option. Extreme Brexiteers just leave without a deal. Some Remainers want a Norway type option. Other Brexiteers want a Canada free trade agreement type thing. Labour just want power. The SNP want a, an independence referendum for Scotland. And the DUP want to preserve the union at all costs. Ignore everyone who says there's no majority for X or Y or Z. There is actually no majority for anything. Now, normally that means a stalemate and it means that a, a vacuum 
appears. And in a vacuum, we end up with, eventually, somebody has to emerge. A messiah, if you like, has to emerge. Either it will become apparent because public opinion will shift in that direction, or that person will start to gain momentum of their colleagues in parliament. Um, momentum is incredibly important in politics. That's another reason they waited until now to put in the letters of no confidence. And that's, again, why there's a, they're waiting to do the full no confidence in the government. It's like Trump. He was ignored at the beginning by the Republican establishment, but once he started to win primaries, the momentum starts to become unstoppable. And once you've won all those primaries, you go into the actual presidential campaign, then your momentum is just so much stronger because of the gains you've made along the way. Whereas Hillary had to deal with dealing with Bernie Sanders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So momentum is key. And so the <laughs> the only problem right now is we're in what I'm sure many of you will have explored in your in your luminary intellectual lives as CFA candidates and charter holders, um, the Condorcet paradox. This is the point that we now appear to be in, which is that when people have preferences, they prefer A over B, B over C, but they also prefer C over A. That gets you really, really stuck. And Delta Poll, I've put the, uh, I've put the link on this slide, Delta Poll are a very good new polling agency. They ask the general public to choose a preference. Do you want May's deal, no deal, or to remain? Uh, and some people didn't want to give preferences, but they sort of they eventually forced them into it. And we got the chart on the table on the right. But then you get the picture on the left, which says it all. So thinking about your view of Brexit for each of the following, please say if it would be your first preference, second preference or third preference. But when you when you start to play them off against each other on the left, you have uh, May's deal beats remain. The middle one. No deal beats remain. But on the right, May's deal beats no deal. And it <laughs> it leads to, <sighs> this is what leads to the stalemate that we're now in. There, at the moment, the British public, at least, haven't really quite decided which way they want to go. And at the moment, MPs are all similarly split, if you take them as a whole, even though some of them have quite clear preferences one way or the other. Uh, it's called Condorcet Paradox. That's the uh, the French philosopher, I think it was, who, who came up with it. Um, and it is, as I say, it's why we're in a stalemate. The only way that you get a winner is when it comes down to two choices. Because then if the third option that some people wanted is not going to happen, those votes have to get redistributed. So this is why, I'm, I know we're coming towards the end of it now, Yes, I'll just do the timeline. This is why uh, these next six weeks are critical. So we've got the European Council Summit. We actually have the House of Commons going on holiday on the 21st of December and coming back on the 7th, although there is provision that they can come back if they need to. Um, there's a 21st of January deadline, which it's still unclear now whether it's genuinely a deadline or not, but there was an EU withdrawal bill June of this year which suggested that, well, it seems to indicate that 21st of January is a deadline for some kind of a deal to be reached or put to Parliament. You then get a number of days to offer a statement of your intentions. Then you get the House of Commons have to debate and the House of Lords have to debate. And then, then we need to know where we are, if we have a deal or not on the withdrawal agreement. Not on the future, not on the future trading partnership, but just on the withdrawal agreement. The key point here is if defeated, the UK leaves with no deal. For all the people out there that say everything that's happened in the last few weeks means no deal is, is, is completely unlikely, it's never going to happen. That is wishful thinking because this is a train going along a track towards no deal. 29th of March, we leave. OK, yes, the EU could delay the, the, the date slightly if they wanted to, uh, even you know the British Parliament could request it. It's very unlikely to be delayed much more than six to eight weeks because there are European parliamentary elections coming up, etc. Plus, why would the EU, when they want to, to, to know 
where the Great Britain stands. Um, of course, yes, no deal would also be bad for the European Union, but obviously it would be pretty bad economically, at least to start with, for the UK. But the point is that that's the default. People are talking right now as if there are three options, no deal, May's deal, and maybe a second referendum. But the reality is, in a stalemate, in the absence of anything else happening, we are going towards no deal. So action has to happen. Now, until this Tory leadership vote today, nobody was taking any action. Nobody wanted any leadership. Nobody wanted to grasp the mantle and run with it themselves. We're now starting to see that they do, but the timeline is so tight. I've put at the bottom there, uh, and the key one I'd like you to pick up on is the 14 days. If the government falls to a no confidence motion in it, there are 14 calendar days to form a new government that could command the confidence of the House before defaulting to a general election. Now, normally the British public could not deal with Parliament club, clubbing together and coming up with a new group of people to, to run us without going through the people first. But the people have been asked so many times, so many questions in the last few years, I very highly doubt they even want to have a general election. You could also have a caretaker short-term government, could be a government of national unity. Whoever it is, they can say, we are going to rule for six months or one year. Then we will have an election after that, and they obviously could legislate for that. But the point here is that 14 days creates its own momentum. That is the moment of most mayhem. That is the moment if you really believe in remaining or exiting, you would get together enough people in Parliament for a coalition of the willing to get through and deliver what you can deliver. So that is the, that's the moment where you don't have to go back to the people, you don't need to have a referendum. All of those things that people talk about, that, 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 that you know, what's the chance of this, that or the other happening, it, it doesn't matter because in that 14 day period, you've got power and you can do what you want with it. And in a situation where the time and the timeline works with you in that scenario, the timeline helps a conclusion to be reached. And what we've found, it found until now, there has been no action, no conclusion, stalemate. We're now in a period where it gets tight, it gets a crisis, and that means somebody can win. And I'm going to leave you with the point before I take your questions. I think of politics as being like Superman versus Clark Kent. Clark Kent was never going to win an election. Nobody knows who he is. Superman, on the other hand, what a guy. He swoops in and saves everybody at the last minute. But you need to have the crisis before you can save everybody. So unfortunately, <laughs> I know it's difficult, particularly for business people, when we see things so rationally and so clearly, but politics is about selling to people and you need to sell the narrative. And that means it's in everybody's interest to create the crisis so somebody can save us. And, and of course, one set believe the answer is revoke Article 50 and never leave. And the other side say, don't pay them a penny, let's just walk away, for example. So that is why we're in a really critical point. Um, this is my contact details. Please do look us up online and check out what we are doing. I'm on Twitter at Market Blondes. Um, and Yes, I, I will leave it there. I could obviously talk about this for hours, but uh, let's see if you guys have any questions. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for a great presentation. So while we wait for some questions to come in, on slide 10, you had, you, there were some comparisons between preferences. Yes. Is it fair to say that the outcome of a new referendum, especially looking at that second circle, would be pretty much identical to the outcome two years ago. I think that, I mean, there's a lot of polling companies who are uh, obviously monitoring and following this and have been consistently for some time. There is a slight suggestion that Remain has gained a little bit of ground, but mainly from new voters or people who didn't vote last time. But certainly they are not commanding a huge lead. So for anyone who wants to remain, it seems to me that a second referendum is a risky strategy. It, it may very well not get you where you want to go. Yeah, because it seems to me that if, if I get the 
no deal and the remain proportion, it just seems the same outcome as the referendum. It is. You're right. But by the time we get to a referendum, we may have a clearer picture of what the future relationship might look like. There's a lot of work being done, for example, on something called Norway or Norway Plus, which is obviously this Norway style arrangement. Um, that's not it's not off the table with May's deal, because deal, obviously May's deal is actually just a deal to leave, not a deal for what we want in the future. But it, it's, it appears at the moment there are too many options. It's too confusing. Too many people want to try different methods to get what they want. I mean, even in the people who want a second referendum, there are some, including Joe Johnson, who I mentioned before, and Justine Greening, who want three options on the ballot paper. Either... Um, they want something like remain, this deal, or no deal. Like literally, obviously, what we've what we've seen there. But the point about the three preferences is, it will be very hard to deduce who has really won. And yeah. people already say that fifty two percent was not a big enough margin. We needed a super majority to leave. How are they going to feel when thirty three point four percent vote to leave in a three way referendum? Yeah. Oh, thank new, you. New um, questions for us. We yes, uh, if anyone has questions, please add them to the Q and A box. I see some person has raised their hand. Unfortunately, there is not much we can do. Oh. So, if you please add your question to the Q and A box, we can address it properly. I'm surprised. Helen, nobody's... you mentioned a caretaker government. Mm. Um, it is a bit difficult to see how that would be uh, done given that there's uh, so many different agendas. And uh, I, how, how could they possibly agree to such a thing? So right now, there are a lot of different agendas. As I said, yes, there is a big split. All the pieces are up in the air. That is going to coalesce in the weeks to come. Uh, as it becomes clear who is actually leading proceedings for Remainers and who's leading for Brexiteers, and public opinion will start to shift a little bit around some of these. It, it will become more clear what the options are. But I would just say in terms of a national government, yes, we often think, goodness, these people could never work with those people. But as we saw with the Liberal Democrats and the Conservative Party in 2010, if you get the chance at power, anyone will be flexible, I would say. Thank you. A question from Timur. What should government do to get the best outcome for the UK? Oh, what a question. What should the government do to get the best outcome? Well, it depends what you mean by best outcome. This is part of the issue all the time on this whole debate, is um, often people think of it in economic terms as a purely you know, sensible, rational economic decision about the cut to GDP and the risk of losing jobs. But of course, that's not how people are approaching this. It is an emotional question for many people. It's a tribal and identity question, a protest question for some as well. So we might say the best thing is to avoid volatility and preserve the status quo. So can you know? let's try and stay close to the EU. Maybe the answer is something like Norway, where we know where we are, we know how Norway works, we could get it done quickly. However, I, the big problem any government has got from this point forward, if we did come up with something like that, or indeed whatever we do come up with, there is a significant proportion of the population who will be angry. Because there will be the Remainers who are angry and the hard Brexiteers who are angry. And actually, we're, talk, you know, we're looking at all of this right now. I would have a very bleak outlook for the direction of the UK UK economy from this point forward simply because the public will be so unhappy and that opens the door to a potential Corbyn government which really would be unilaterally pretty bad for the uh, economics of the UK. Thank you. A question from Afonso. It would seem that your best uh, base case scenario is she will lose the vote. This is the danger of doing this, isn't it? Like, what, six six hours and 20 minutes before we find the result? 
I mean, look, my base case scenario is 50-50, which is annoying, I know. But through the work I have done this morning and who I've been talking to and what I've looked at things, I think it's a it's slightly more in favour of her losing, slightly. Uh, that is just my sense on assessing people's, you know, as I say, we've looked at every MP, how have they voted, what is their personal ideology, how strongly do they feel against getting a, a strong Remainer or a strong Brexiteer. Generally speaking, the Conservative Party quite likes to chop down its leaders. It's a history of doing it. Uh, and therefore, that's why overall I put a slightly, I put it like 45% chance she wins. Thank you. Uh, le let me add to that a quick question. One way or another, I mean, can we uh, take a conclusion of that? I think the conclusion that if she loses yep. is, is that, that all options remain open. Yes. Is there a stronger conclusion we can make that in the case she wins? If she wins, then all you're going to do is entrench people who are frustrated then. So there's a pressure cooker right now and the steam is building up and you're trying to like let off the steam. If she wins and you can't challenge her for 12 months, the steam just keeps building. And I see. And we know 48 MPs were happy, you know, so, so desperate to get rid of they put in a letter. And we will also know in the margin of her victory, let's say even still 100 MPs were against her. I mean, we know 100, that means we know 100 were against her. We know maybe another 100 were going to vote against uh, this deal. Like, she doesn't have any legitimacy anyway. So she's then a, a kind of lame duck prime minister. And, right. sorry, most importantly, the DUP are strongly suggesting if she stays as prime minister, they will be unable to continue to support the government. So even if she wins, the government may fall anyway. Thank you. Uh, an interesting question from Yanni. Who is your best bet to emerge as the messiah if we reach the 14 day, uh, day crisis? Ah, phase? Yes, very interesting. Very unusual that by, the, the, you know, in a world of politicians who love the limelight, that person is not already apparent to us. I think that's quite, quite a surprise. But of course, the, the, the only MP who is recognized throughout the country and the world by one name, and that's Mr. Boris Johnson. He's not, well, <laughs> actually I was gonna say, he's not the Messiah, he's a very naughty boy, which is a, actually a, a line from Life of Brian, a Monty Python film. But no, he, he, uh, he has won uh, elections, he has laid out a plan for something called Super Canada Plus. And also at the weekend he said, let's withhold half of the 39 billion we should pay to the EU before, you know, to try and get what we want. So he's actually coming up with something that it might not work, it might sound crazy, but it's something that the man on the street could understand. You know what, these guys don't, don't want to give us what we want, well, we won't give them the money. Um, so, but, you know, the important thing here is to think about who is a good communicator. You know, a lot of us struggle with Donald Trump, but his words connect with people. Obviously, they connect to upset people as well as to uh, inspire them. But I, we need to look at who's a good communicator. And, I mean, Chuck Amana is trying on the Remainer side of the Labour Party. Keir Starmer has done very well as well. But they're not really household names. So, um, I, you know, the money is still on Boris, I'm afraid. Thank you. A question from Raxit. You mentioned the public having lack of appetite to vote again for a new government. If you assume for a moment that they do have appetite, do you think the existing results would repeat themselves in voting for a conservative government and for Britain to exit? So a good question, yes. Would the public vote the same way again if they were asked? I think quite strongly, yes, they would. Uh, we've we've t touched on the polls and how they haven't shifted that much in terms of remain versus leave. Uh, when it comes to the actual uh, mechanic, uh, you know, the final outcome for an election for a government. I mean, the polls again there have been very steady, and effectively, people have said, "Well, we don't really want either of you." You know, it will probably change by maybe ten seats in one direction or the other, but it's but it's 
not very clear it would resolve anything. I don't see anything changing the dial for the British people on either of those. Thank you. And, and a last question from Sangeeta. Given that older people voted leave and younger people voted remain, would the second referendum yield a remain result since some of those older people may no longer be there and more younger people have become eligible? That is a very good point. And yes, that is picked up in the polling. That is given as a reason for why remain is slightly ahead, literally the demographics. So I can't I can't disagree with that. I think but think you know it's very i think we would say look if we have another referendum it's still 50 50. um it, it may slightly more favor remain but you you don't know who's going to turn out uh, as well in that uh, referendum i think the biggest fear of a second referendum is if people don't get the result they want does that mean you have another one and another one and another one till you get the result you want but much more corrosive a lot of this vote was a protest against the establishment and institutions of government. And it is exactly what's taking place all over the world, not just Italy, not just Trump, not even just Bolsonaro in Brazil or Duterte in the Philippines. The financial crisis caused a huge economic dislocation. When that happens, you have significant political realignment. It always happens. The time it takes just depends on the uh, structure of your political system and how quickly your institutions shift. So in Greece, a new party can be created tomorrow. In the UK or the US, you have to go within the current, current setup to get there. So if, if and this anti-establishment mood is only increasing, it's not, you know, it's not getting any, it's not, it's not, it's not dissipating. You know, the, the, the rally in asset prices, the strong, strength in equity markets, and even employment, which is going pretty well, people still do not feel the benefit of what is one of the longest and longest recoveries you know that we have ever seen so if we have another referendum this, the bigger worry is that you inflame the anti-establishment sentiment uh, and ultimately look Nigel Farage has been ripping up his UKIP membership saying he's going to launch a new movement don't rule out somebody like him coming to change things so the, the political system is going to be more fractured, more polarized, and more divisive than it's been in our investing lifetimes. And that is something we all have to get used to. Oh, thank you, Helen. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Let's see how it goes later. Thanks, everyone. Yes. This webinar ends our 2018 program. I wish you all great year-end holidays, and I look forward to seeing you next year.